Let's welcome in our first guest of the 9 o'clock hour. He is the House Judiciary Chairman, Moore Capito. Moore, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Rob. Glad to be here. I uh, had asked what the best you know way to get uh, in front of uh, the, the folks here, and I thought that I was going to you know, maybe get asked to buy some books, but I guess it's going to be radon. Radon. So, you know? <laughs> radon test. Your test. choice, not mine. I tried. Think However, safety. if you want to buy a book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was a shameless self-promotion. You're right <laughs> yeah. about that. I was telling more during the uh, TV timeout here that uh, covered his high school football games when they played in the playoffs against a couple of Eastern Panhandle schools uh, way back when, and now you're the House Judiciary Chairman, and I'm still doing the same thing. It's it's no different. Being on the field down in Charleston uh, is similar than being on the football field in high school, I can tell you that. Um, yeah. Not as much handshaking as there was back then at the, <laughs> when you come off the field, but uh, that was a heck of a game versus Musselman. Unfortunately, we were on the wrong side of that one. But Yeah, well, yeah. you've done well since. It's been, it's, been, uh, it's been a good run so far, but we're just getting started. I know you're running for governor. We just finished a legislative session that uh, concluded Saturday late. Uh, if you could wrap up some of the uh, the fun stuff from the session on Saturday. I know there was a lot of drama over the weekend that was taking place, too. Uh, but I'll leave it up to you to kind of recap it in whatever way you'd like. Sure. I think uh, you're the first person that's uh, categorized it as fun. But uh, front and center, you know, of course, it's got to be the largest tax cut in the history of the state, 750 uh, million dollars. Uh, can't talk about that enough to be able to deliver sort of tax relief to the people of West Virginia. Uh, incredibly proud of that. We all worked very hard to ensure that we could come together on something uh, that was meaningful, uh, that sent a message uh, to those that are not in the state that we're doing the right things in West Virginia and we're taking the right right steps to, to grow. Uh, so that's got to be front and center in the discussion. I think anytime we talk about the results of this legislative session, uh, we've also got to talk about education. I mean, uh, one of the last things that we were able to get over the line, I know on Saturday, uh, it was late, probably past a lot of folks' bedtime, but uh, we got a critical bill uh, for our K-3 through uh, education program ensuring that we can try to get teaching assistance in every uh, first, second, and third grade classroom, which I think is going to be a game changer. Obviously, when we look at growth, we know that uh, along with that comes strain as well. Uh, I know you all experience that here, but uh, that's got to be, uh, we've got to focus on our education system, so we're making uh, strides there as well. Um, you know, we've done uh, a lot of other uh, issues when it relates to state employees. We've tried to, you know, create more uh, opportunities, give pay raises to our state employees, which is uh, critically important. In our committee and the judiciary, we've looked at ways that we can, uh, you know, give greater protection to our to our children. We have uh, we understand that the that the that the effects of this scourge of this opioid scourge, which I know that you all experience here, we experience throughout the state, uh, is having on our uh, families and children. Uh, so, how do we provide greater protections, greater help, um, and ensuring that the folks that are bringing these sorts of terrible things into our community are uh, are leaving our community and never coming back. Before so. Bill goes, where are you going to be in Martinsburg today, around the area? Looking forward to uh, meeting up with the mayor later, Mayor Knowles, and uh, discussing some of the uh, issues that are uh, confronting the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, I know uh, when we look, uh, you know, northeast, uh, we uh, look wide-eyed at the success that's going on here, the success that's uh, happening in, in this part of the state, how critical it is to the success of the state as a whole. Uh, so we know that you all have a lot of good things going. I'm looking forward to meeting with him and some other business folks uh, today to learn about uh, some of the great things that are going on here. Billy. Yeah, uh, first, congratulations on the tax bill. Uh, when we think of the success, we tend to gravitate to uh, uh, the ones that's more uh, been more visible, such as the governor, President Blair, uh, Speaker Hanshaw, and the like. But I suspect a lot of the success goes to you and your colleague in the Senate side, Charlie Trump. And uh, so I, uh, it was a success. You, you accomplished something many folks thought you would not be able to do. Uh, and I will, will probably never know the, the 
level of success was that was reflected with you and Charlie Trump, but I suspect this quite a bit. I do have a question, though. That was a statement. So a question is, <laughs> PEIA, uh, that was another uh, something had to be done, uh, and you broke it into three parts, and that probably will be the successful way to go. But the appropriation side, we've been told over and over again the lack of caseworkers that are involved with ch uh, child protective services. Uh, this is the very this is the very basic building block, and we hear that the caseworkers, at least in the Eastern Panhandle, uh, their caseload is five times greater than what you have in adjacent states. I don't care how much organizational change you make, how much shifting you do of organizational structure, if you cannot get the resources to the caseworkers to get a more reasonable caseload, uh, nothing's going to work. So, quick question with that long prologue, uh, what are you going to do to address the casework uh, load? I, you know, I, I've got to give uh, Senator Trump incredible uh, props for bringing this to the forefront. He's been uh, certainly one of the members of the legislature that has been uh, sort of amplifying the importance of uh, of, of this very issue. Uh, and let me just say that he uh, has been somebody that I've learned an incredible amount from. I can't think of a smarter person uh, that is in the Capitol those 60 days than than Charlie Trump. Uh, but you bring up a great point. You know, we have these are these are issues that are that seem sort of local, uh, but there there are issues that are happening everywhere. So whether it's looking at how we budget and fund uh, these workers in a, in a better way, how do we streamline processes to ensure that the information flow that, that our workers are getting as it relates to the work that they're doing is efficient and streamlined in a way that it is creating uh, the best outcome ultimately for the people of West Virginia. I, I think that this is something, you know, I, I wasn't sure if they, you were going to ask me, what are the things that we need to continue to look at that we didn't get quite to the line or that we need to push for more. That's certainly one of them, I think, as we move into interims and continue to study. I know that he'll be pushing on it, but I'm right there behind him. Mr. Gilstrap. Take us a little bit behind the scenes on the tax cut thing. It seemed for so long that nothing was getting done, that almost like battle lines had been drawn. We had the, the House passed right away, the, the, the big tax cut, and then nothing and nothing and nothing. So was it, in fact, a logjam of ideas for a long time that finally broke through, or was it a series of, of unpublicized uh, negotiations that were happening behind the scenes and what finally broke it free? Well, I think what you saw probably publicized was a little bit, uh, there may have been some hyperbole on some of the statements. <laughs> well, not, not you all, of course, never, never you all. Uh, but, you know, I think initially it was good to get the vehicle out there. And we, and, 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 and we got together actually on the radio, I believe, once that vehicle got started from the House and went over to the Senate. As a matter of fact, I think we spoke last over the phone when the Senate had sort of sent back that press release of what they wanted to see in the tax, uh, the tax relief package that we were going to do. And I think I mentioned to you all at that point that I was confident that there was such a desire to provide relief to the people of West Virginia that we would get there. Uh, and it wasn't shortly after that that sort of, as you mentioned, cooler heads prevail and, and say, look, we got to come to the table. Uh, we all want the same thing. It's a question, obviously, about how we get it done. Uh, so I think there was some give and take. There was give from the governor's office. There was give from the House. And I think there was give from the Senate. Uh, uh, but, you know, as they say, if, uh, if nobody gets everything they want, then everybody's getting something they want, then it's probably a pretty good deal. And I think we ultimately got there. Look, we've put triggers in place where hopefully we'll be able to, to, to get back and, and reassess more tax relief. I think we've done it in a responsible way uh, that, that, that hits taxpayers in West Virginia, that provides uh, certain businesses and small businesses relief. So I think we got a really great package out there. I think uh, at the end of the day, it's something we've got to celebrate, spike the foot football on to go back to the to the reference i did spike the football in that game that's a penalty way. in high school yeah yeah uh, but anyway so you know incredibly proud of that but 
glad we were all able to get on the same page. I think everybody's pleased with uh, the ultimate outcome. Now, a part of the final package, if if I read it correctly, is a rebate on the car tax coming mm-hmm. back to people. Is, are the logistics in place to handle that? We talked about that last time. I think it's going to be a challenge any time that you put that sort of strain, that many uh, rebates in the system uh-huh. at one time. Uh, I think we receive some assurances, I believe, from the tax department uh, that they would be able to handle the load. This was a, a critically important uh, thing for a lot of legislature legislators to see relief on our uh, uh, you know vehicles. So I'm confident we'll be able to get it done. Is that going to work as a direct credit on your taxes when you file your state income taxes, or will it actually be money shifted to your account? I think it's uh, a rebate. I would have to look exactly on how they're going to work that, but I think it's file the taxes and then apply for the rebate is what was my understanding. I thought it was a credit, but it, you may well be right. So that's but right. I think there's a form. I, I, I th- I'd have to get back to yeah. you on exactly yeah. the functionality of it. Yeah. I've heard two or three different versions yeah. of how yeah. this is going to actually take yeah. place, so yeah. I'm not 100% yeah. clear yeah. on this yet. Yeah. Let me, can I shift to the fact that you're going to be running for governor, and you're you're running against some uh, individuals that are well-known, uh, well-established, well-recognized. Uh, what was part of the decision process that you went through? No one, probably you anticipated, who would be running against you for governor. So I think you were the first out, weren't you? I Wilson, I think. So. Wilson was the first. The, no, uh, there was one out that was a, about a year before. But to answer your question, I didn't really try to look at it through a lens of who was going to be there or what the other candidates uh, were going to do and who was going to do it and when they were going to do it. Uh, in making that decision, I've always wanted to be the best that I could be for West Virginia. I'm a lifelong West Virginia, you know, as a father and a and a and a graduate of our uh, public school system here in West Virginia. I've always been incredibly passionate about West Virginia, and I've always said if I thought that I could make a difference in the state of West Virginia, I would go to where I could make the biggest difference. I believe uh, that started in the House of Delegates. Uh, it grew into a larger role, becoming chair of the uh, of a very uh, busy committee uh, in the legislature uh, in realizing through that work uh, as chair that really my primary, I mean, we, we, we saw 171 pieces of legislation come through that, uh, th- through that committee uh, this year. And it, it really takes a collaborative effort and it takes somebody that can bring both sides, whether you're talking intra or inter uh, legislature. You know, we've got a lot of uh, folks within the same party now. We got, you know, 88 members. Uh, so it's a lot of bringing people together and being able to deliver results. I think I've been very effective of uh, doing that in my role uh, as judiciary chair. But I've always been someone that wants to to go sort of dive after something and. Uh, kind of be aggressive and be gritty uh, and, and think big, but not be afraid to go to go sort of full steam ahead. And that's what I'm ready to do and take the next step to do that. Do you have anything that would distinguish you from the other candidates? Obviously, your name uh, is going to help a great deal. Uh, but besides that, uh, do you have, uh, uh, besides a passion, everybody has a passion. Of course. Everybody has experience. Sure. Everybody has a desire to do the right thing. Do you have something that you will use as your five-second elevator speech and say, it should be me that you, you vote for? Communication. I'm a big uh, listener. I think communication with the ability to deliver on what I've heard. And I, I think what I've shown to my colleagues and what I've shown to my constituents is that I'm able to get into a room, I'm able to listen, and then I'm able to deliver. And I think I've proven that over the past you know, three years with some of the most aggressive legislation that we've seen in the state of West Virginia. I've delivered on uh, on pieces from, you know, within our party. I've worked with folks that are not in our party. I've worked with independents. And I've always had an open door policy. Uh, and, and, and really, I think I've delivered results and executed and been able to deliver the tools to other parts of our state government to allow them and empower them to grow West Virginia from the ground up. You are the cousin of Riley Moore. He is I am. the state treasurer, and he is also running for higher office 
as well. Do the two of you consult on campaigns and things like that? Of course. We talk like any uh, uh, of, we run into each other at the Capitol uh, all the time. It's great to have our uh, kids that get to uh, to see each other at birthday parties now that he's down in uh, our neck of the woods for a little while. Uh, he's a great political mind and he's always wonderful to talk to. Uh, of course, we got to, to talk and work a lot when he was uh, in the house as well which was a great thing, and uh, we continue to do that. Did you guys make sure to coordinate that you weren't going to run for the same office? We talk about how we can make West Virginia better. Uh, and and so uh, we don't really co- – I don't think anybody coordinates or plans anything. I think you gravitate to the place where you believe you can make the biggest difference, and I think that's what he's doing, and that's exactly what I'm doing. Obviously, it's a very political family, right? Uh, as a kid growing up, did you think that this would be a path that you would follow? I don't think anybody at, at an early, early age knows exactly what they want to do. Uh, um, of course, we're all still wondering what we're going to do when we grow up. But, uh, you know, I did have the advantage of being in a family that valued public service, that took it seriously. I uh, I sat at the dinner table when, the you know, when calls were sort of taken uh, from – from, from constituents and communities and churches about the uh, issues that are important to West Virginia. So to see uh, how far we've come and, and the progress that we've made has been, uh, you know, certainly eye-opening and I think advantageous to be able to carry uh, some of the momentum that we have now forward. I know you have to roll to some meetings here in the Eastern Panhandle, so final word is yours. More Capito. Look, we hear all the time in West Virginia uh, about all of our potential. We're finally starting to see some of it. Uh, we are on a roll, uh, and we have uh, a governor right now that is uh, that is sort of running with the ball. And we've got to have someone that's able to sort of take that torch, be able to run with it that was part of building it. Uh, and, and I was there. I'm uh, incredibly grateful to be able to spend time here in the eastern panhandle you all are an exemplar of what growth looks like we uh, all appreciate and look toward uh, this area we know that uh, with growth comes issues so we have to focus on our uh, infrastructure i know that you are dealing with some of that now as you you know we continue to work on exit 12 on off of 81 there and in the in the continued work that we have to do on route 9 but all of these infrastructure projects uh, we have to continue to focus on and never take our eye off and I know small business is a huge part of the eastern panhandle and that's why I'm looking forward to me- meeting with some small business leaders while I'm here be sure to say hey to knuckles nosy for us I will do that it's good to see you all good nice seeing you, seeing you.